Uh, I was uh, at a, uh, a conference in Nashville, Tennessee a couple months ago, and um, I heard a guy talk named Robbie Gallaty. He's a pastor up in Nashville, Tennessee. I'd heard the name before, but hadn't really heard of him much. But he, he, uh, he was telling a story about a conversation he had uh, a while ago. Um, this was maybe a couple, couple years ago, he had this conversation with a missionary, a missionary who had been, spent some time overseas. It was in a, a South American country. I don't remember which country it was, but in this conversation, this guy was telling him about a story, how they, this, this missionary uh, went with a group, and they were handing out Bibles in a, uh, a small village kind of up in the mountains in this South American country. And they went in, uh, they're handing out New Testaments. And so he handed this New Testament to a guy, and he uh, you know, said, hey, this, this is a, the New Testament, it's the Bible. And the guy looked at him, and he said, hey, I want to be honest with you. If, I, if you give that to me, I'm going to rip the pages out and use it to smoke marijuana. Like, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. And the guy's like, uh, okay, uh, take it anyway. And he said, okay, fine. And so they went, and they, they, they handed out Bibles, and they moved on. And the, guy, the missionary didn't go back to that village. Uh, it was three years later. He went back to that village because he had heard that there was a movement of God going on, and there were people coming to Christ, and he wanted to go see what was going on. And so he went back. And he found the guy that he had given the Bible to. And this guy was one of the leaders of a church in this village. And so he went and talked to him. He said, like, what happened? Like, how, how did you come to follow Jesus? And, uh, and the guy said, well, you know, you, you gave me a Bible. He's like, yeah, I remember that. I remember what you said you were going to do with it. And he said, yeah. So I started in Matthew. I, I came to Matthew, and I smoked Matthew. <laughs> he said, I got to Mark, and I smoked Mark. I got to Luke. And I smoked Luke. And I got to John, and John smoked me. <laughs> and he gave his life to Jesus and became a leader in the church. And it just hit me, hearing that story, just the impact of just God's word, of scripture, and just reading it and being in it and understanding it is a, has a, is a powerful, powerful thing in our lives. And so we come to this, this kind of, uh, th- we've come to the end of our journey through Ephesians, and I know, there's so much that we have gone through in Ephesians, so many uh, you know, topics that we've, we've gone in and out as Paul has written, we've gone through his writings to this uh, church at Ephesus. But the thing that has really been the theme that has woven through this church in Ephesians, uh, the, the book of Ephesians, we see the, the Trinity. We see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit over and over and over again. And so what we're going to do today is take a look at what is this? What is this doctrine of the Trinity? What, how, how, do we, how, how should we understand, properly understand God? And more specifically, how does Paul reveal this doctrine of the Trinity in Ephesians? And for many people, this word doctrine has a stuffy uh, academic sense. There's kind of a, a, a snootiness to it that potentially it refers to things that people who, who have letters after their names, they talk about uh, in closed rooms with smoke in the air maybe, but not have much, not much real life application. And I get that. And maybe it's because the word doctrine sounds like doctor. I, I don't know. And it just sounds like a very uh, stuffy thing. But doctrine can be used in, in um, unhelpful ways. I get that. But I wanted to uh, propose to you that that's not the doctrine's fault. That's the fault of those who are using it. <laughs> and if we can properly understand, if we pro- properly understand doctrine, it actually leads us to have great application in our lives. And so that, that is my prayer just getting into this today, because in reality, doctrine has huge implications for our lives. The, uh, the theologian uh, A.W. Tozer has famously said that the most, what comes into our minds when we think about God, that is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And there, there can be debate about, if that, is that really the most important thing? But it certainly is a very important thing. When we think about God, what do we think about? That's incredibly important because that will have ramifications in our lives. Paul knew this. Paul knew that doctrine has huge uh, implications for our lives. And more specifically, he knew that doctrine was going to be very important in the lives of the Ephesian church of the believers in Ephesus. Because when, when, we when we just look at the conversations that Paul had with the leaders of the Ephesian church, but just members of the Ephesian church as well, the letters he wrote to them, it becomes apparent that he knew that what they believed was going to have an effect in their lives. Remember, Ephesus is a place of a, with diverse spiritual teaching. I mean, there is a lot of spiritual teaching and doctrine that is being passed around in the city of Ephesus. And so Paul is very particular about, he says, hey, watch out. Watch out. So in Acts 20, Paul is having a conversation with the Ephesian elders, the leaders of this church in Ephesus. And he tells them, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. He said that from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. 
That's quite a prediction. From among yourselves, there's going to come, guys, who are going to preach things that are, that are not right. So you watch out. Keep watch. Paul, he's talking to Timothy, who was a leader in the Ephesian church. 1 Timothy 1, verse 3, Paul says, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. He tells, tells Timothy, hey, hey, go, stay there. Make sure that no one's teaching a different doctrine than what I told you. And then a couple verses later, uh, he tells Timothy, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. You see that good doctrine leads to godly love. Good doctrine leads to godly love. Later in 1 Timothy uh, uh, 6, at the end of 1 Timothy, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, then he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. In Ephesians 4, 14, which a few weeks ago uh, Pastor Allen preached on, Paul writes that God, God has given the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. This word that we read doctrine, is, it's the Greek word, uh, didaskalia is the name of this Greek word. It's often translated teaching, doctrine, instruction. It's actually used 21 times in the New Testament. Uh, Paul uses it 19 of those 21 times, this word doctrine. So it's something that he... he <laughs> places a high value on, and over three quarters of the times that he uses this word, he's warning the people, be careful. Hey, be careful. Don't believe different doctrine than what, than what the Lord Jesus Christ has preached to us and the different gospel than what I'm preaching to you. He says, be careful, keep alert, because he wants them to hold the sound doctrine so that their faith might be genuine. So doctrine is important. So this specific doctrine that we're talking about today is the doctrine of the Trinity, the Trinity. What is the doctrine of the Trinity? This, this is a concise explanation. There's one God who eternally exists as three persons, all of whom are fully God. One God who eternally exists as three persons, and each of whom is fully God. The uh, theologian and writer Wayne Grudem, he summarizes it in these three statements. He said, these are three statements that are all true about the Trinity. God exists as three persons, each person is God, there is only one God. If you get each, each of those three statements, if we, if we understand and, and, and affirm each of those as true, that is a faithful doctrine of the Trinity. Each of them is true. Well, how is this possible? How is this possible? Let's, let's dive into this. And I, we'll, we're going to talk through kind of a, a logical series of statements. And uh, some of this thought process is taken from a guy named uh, Abdu Murray. He's a, uh, he was a Muslim, actually, for much of his life. And uh, through a, an, an investigation and really exploring the Gospels and Scriptures and the history of Christianity, he came to put his faith in Christ. He is now a great speaker and writer on behalf of, of Christianity. Uh, so some of this thought process is taken from him. But, but first, so the, the, the first step to think about and, and, and stating how is this possible, that God exists as three persons, each person is God, but there is only one God. First, we need to affirm that God is one in being or essence, but he is three in person. One in being or essence, but three in person. What does that mean? Well, there, there's a Greek word, uh, ousias, O-U-S-I-A-S, ousias, that means substance, it means uh, essence of something, and so this, this Greek word homoousias means same substance or same essence, and so you could say that about the three persons of, of the Trinity. That word, actually, that word uh, homoousias actually became very important, uh, and all the way back in 325 A.D., just about 300 years after Jesus, there was a gathering of, of church leaders in the city of Nicaea, which is in uh, modern-day Turkey. They all gathered there mainly to determine the nature of Jesus. Who, who was Jesus? Because uh, they were countering, there, there was a doctrine that was being taught by this guy named Arius. Arius was saying, oh, Jesus was created, actually, just before the earth was created. Uh, so he's like, he's great, but he's not uh, eternal. And so they all gather together and said, no, 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 Jesus, he is homoousias, same substance, same essence with God the Father and with the Spirit. So God is one in being, but three in person. And in this case, when we say person, that does not mean separate being as we normally think of it. As we normally, when we normally use the word person, that's what we usually mean, a separate being. So I am one being and one person. I am one being and one person. God is one being and three persons. Hanging with me? 
So everything has a whatness. There is a what is it. Everything has a whatness to it. So for example, um, this, this uh, remote has a whatness to it. The what is this? This is an inanimate object, right? This is an object. It is uh, probably made of plastic. Not much to it. I also have a what. I am a living being. God has a what. God is a divine being. You see, this, that, that, that's the, the what of who God is. Not everything has a who-ness to it. There's not a who about everything. If I, if I ask uh, who is my phone, it doesn't make much sense, and I don't even want to get into Siri and Google Voice and all that. It's not, not what we're getting into right now. No, no the, the inanimate objects don't have a who-ness to it. If you ask who am I, my, what is my who-ness? Well, I'm, I'm Ben, and there's more to me, but that's, that's a concise understanding of it, of me. If you ask who God is, you will find that he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The whatness is the nature of what something is, and the who-ness is the personhood. And so God exists as one in his nature, his whatness. He exists as one in his nature, as a divine being, but he exists as three in his personhood, in the, the who, who is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If this is difficult to wrap your mind around, that's not only normal, it's actually good. If you feel like this, uh, this is Julia Roberts, I think, yeah. If you feel like this, don't worry. It's actually, it's actually normal. It's quite normal. Uh, we actually have a difficult time fully comprehending the nature and who God is. We have a difficult time figuring this out. And here's a few reasons. Here's a few reasons why. We are only one. We are one nature and one personhood. It is very difficult for our minds to wrap around a God who is, or a being who is one in being and three in personhood. Also, we had a beginning and God is eternal. If you just, just think about a finite being trying to fully comprehend an infinite being, you're not going to get all the way. You know, th think about an ant, right? An ant is a finite being. We are finite beings. An ant cannot fully comprehend everything about our lives, correct? Like there, there, there's a huge gap there. Just think about the gap between us and God. There is a gap there. Uh, we are also made in the image of God. Now, an image or a likeness is not going to be exactly the same thing. There is going to be a limitation to it. If I take a picture of a TV, that's not going to be as complex as the TV itself. So it makes sense that there is going to be, we're going to have a difficult time wrapping fully our minds around who God is. Now, if you ever reach a point where you, you think you fully understand the nature and the personhood of God, then he's either made up or he's too small. If you ever think a point where I fully understand God, let me go back here, then he's actually, that's actually not a God that is, you haven't fully grasped the concept of who God is, because that he would either be a made-up God that you just came up with in your mind, or he's a God that is too small. I'm grateful, though, that God has revealed himself. God has revealed himself in his word, and that's what we're going to get into. And so some, some thoughts before we go any further. Uh, sometimes there will be analogies. Sometimes there will be analogies uh, for the Trinity. I don't know if you've heard any analogies. Some people will say God is like water. Uh, there's, there's steam, there's liquid, and then there's ice. It's kind of there are, th all, there are three different things, but that's all the same God. Um, a clover leaf, there's, there's, there's many analogies. I want to tell you most analogies are unhelpful. Most analogies are going to fall short, and you actually end up closer to what has historically been considered a heresy about God. <laughs> so, you know, don't panic or anything, but just in, in general, analogies are going, to, are going to fall short of truly grasping the full doctrine of the Trinity. Today, we're going to be focusing mostly on, the, we're going to be focusing on the book of Ephesians in large part, and what it reveals about the Trinitarian nature of God, but there's also going to be some other passages that really help, that, that lend some, uh, some helpful insight into who God is. And so there's going to be a lot of Scripture uh, today. It's Scripture heavy today, but what I hope we understand is how widespread and how pervasive this doctrine of the Trinity is in Scripture. It is a powerful thing. And so if, if every single thing today doesn't find a neat little box in our brain to put it there, don't worry. Don't panic. You're in good company. What I hope today is that we know God even a little bit better. If we know God even a little bit more today, then that is a good thing. Why is the doctrine of the Trinity important? Well, two big reasons. One is it helps us truly know God, as we were just talking about. It helps us to truly know who God 
is, because that God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so if we, if we don't understand that, then we're not fully understanding God. Um, this is a book that uh, both Alan and I have mentioned multiple times over the last uh, couple of years, uh, Delighting in the Trinity by Michael Reeves. Um, one of the best books you can read on the Trinity, I'll say that. It is, it is uh, short, concise, and he writes, uh, I don't know how to put, he honestly reminds me of um, uh, kind of C.S. Lewis, not only because he's British, but he writes in a very entertaining way. Delighting in the Trinity, excellent book. He said this on the first page of the, first page of the introduction. He says this, For it is only when you grasp what it means for God to be a trinity that you really sense the beauty, the overflowing kindness, the heart-grabbing loveliness of God. It starts with our understanding of the trinity. So one reason the doctrine of the trinity is important is it helps us to truly know God. Two is it distinguishes the true God from all other false gods. It distinguishes the true God from all other false gods. I want to say now, we're not going to spend a lot of time today and, and hardly any time on some specific heresies about the Trinity. There, there are specific beliefs about God that have been labeled as heresies that, um, that can be helpful to know. We're not, just for time's sake, we're not going to go a lot into it today. What we are going to focus on is what is the true doctrine of the Trinity. And, you know, often banks will, um, and when, when they train tellers to, to identify counterfeits, what they do is they train them extra well on what does a true bill look like, because there's an infinite number of counterfeits out there, and you can't train everybody on everything. But if you know the true meaning, if you know, if you know the true source, if you know that, then you can identify counterfeits. That's what we're focusing on today. So many people will try to tell you that all religions are pretty much the same. We're worshiping the same. We're all worshiping the same God, right? You ever heard that? We're all, we're all, we all have a piece of the truth. We're all just kind of worshiping you know, the same God. But when you truly understand and look into each religion, you, you find that no, no, no. That there's no way that that can actually be true. Uh, Islam teaches that there's only one God, Allah. He is one in being and person. That does not that does not uh, mesh with Christianity. Uh, Hinduism teaches that there's many gods, millions of gods. In fact, uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, actually, they deny the eternal nature of Jesus, just like that guy Arius did. Right? They say Jesus is not actually eternal, he's created. Biblical Christianity, we teach that there is one God who eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all of them are God. And this is actually the, the one doctrine that really separates a true biblical Christianity from all other religions. And even, and even actually provides clarity in determining there, if there's groups who call themselves Christian, you can look at this doctrine and say, what do they believe about who God is? That will, actually, that will reveal a lot about are they, are they really being faithful to Scripture or are they going off on their own into the weeds? So this doctrine of the Trinity, it's a core doctrine. Without it, you easily fall into heresy and, then, and not actually understand properly who God is and what He has done for us. Uh, Michael Reeves, again, in his book, Delighting in the Trinity, he said, For what makes Christianity absolutely distinct is the identity of our God, which God we worship. That is the article of faith that stands before all others. The bedrock of our faith is nothing less than God himself in every aspect of the gospel, creation, revelation, salvation. It is only Christian insofar as it is the creation, revelation, and salvation of this God, the triune God. The Trinity is the cockpit of all Christian thinking. So we've talked about doctrine, we've talked about this doctrine of the Trinity, why it's important. Let's look at the Trinity in Ephesians. How does Paul get into it? And remember, I don't know if I've said this yet, the word Trinity is not used ever in Scripture. That word is not used in Scripture, but what it does, the word, the word Trinity was come up with, we'll talk about this in a little bit, it was come up with by this guy named Tertullian in the second century, uh, the Latin word trinitas, and it simply is a word to express this truth that we see all throughout Scripture. So the Trinity in Ephesians. And so from the very beginning of Ephesians, like, like chapter 1, like verse 1, 2, 3, 4, we see this doctrine of the Trinity, that it is prevalent. The word Father, God, uh, Paul uses Father eight times, and he uses God 32 times, and most of those times he's referring to God the Father. Uh, he uses uh, in him or in Christ, that's used 23 times. We've talked a lot about that as we've gone through Ephesians. And then the, the Holy Spirit is referenced 12 times in reference to the Holy Spirit. Like, why is the Trinity talked about so often? Well, besides the fact that it's who God is and how he exists, I think another reason that Paul really gets into this is it is a new thing to the Ephesians. M most of these believers at the church at Ephesus, are probably first-generation Christians. 
And this, this, this is a new concept for them. And so as Paul, as he talks about salvation, he's talking about it as it refers to the Trinity. But it also combats the spiritual teaching uh, of the uh, Ephesus um, city at the time. So what we're going to do today is just look at the diff- each person of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and just a couple of two or three statements that are true that we see from the book of Ephesians about each person of the Trinity. Let's look at the Father. The Father is the source of the Son and Spirit. This is the first truth that we see from Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 17, Paul prays, he prays that the the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of Him. 1 John 4, 14 says, We have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Uh, John chapter 17, the gospel of John chapter 17, one of the greatest chapters to study. If you, want, if you want to really learn about the Trinity from Scripture, go to John 17. There's a great, a lot of great uh, Trinitarian uh, uh, wording there. John 17 verse 3, Jesus prays to the Father. He says, this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And Jesus goes on to say that the Father sent him. He says that six more times in that chapter. So the Father is the source of the Son and the Spirit. The Father has sent the Son. The Father has sent His Spirit to be among us. We'll talk about the Spirit more in a second. Uh, John 14, verses 16 and 17, Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. So the Father will give you the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus says. So we see the Father sends the Son and the Spirit. Now, now, now there are many who say that both the Father and the Son Uh, send the Spirit. In fact, this is actually one of the biggest differences between Eastern Orthodox Christianity and Western Christianity. And then Western Christianity includes Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. That's that's one of the big divides why we have an Eastern Orthodox Christianity and a Western. The Eastern Orthodox says only the Father has given the Spirit. But the, the, the Western Church has said, no, both the Father and the Son have sent the Spirit. And some compromise and say that the Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. This is, this is one of the things that has divided uh, the church over here. There are other divisions and reasons why the church has divided Eastern into Western over the years, but this is one of them. So the Father is the source of the Son and the Spirit. Secondly, the Father takes the lead in creation, predestination, and providence, and the, the, the ordering of world events, providence. Now, it's worth noting, as we're going, especially as we're going through each of these truths about the persons of the Trinity, all members of the Trinity, participate in the works of all other members of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They all participate. They all are 100% God. But what we see in Scripture is that certain persons of the Trinity will take the lead. They will take the lead in certain aspects of the world. So the Father takes the lead in creation, predestination, and providence. So in, in Genesis 2, we see that God breathed life into the first human. Read in Ephesians 1, uh, verse 11. That the Father works all things according to His will, providence, including our salvation. So Paul says, Ephesians 1, verse 11, In Him, Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him, the Father, who works all things according to the counsel of His will. So the Father works all things according to the counsel of His will. It is the Father who takes the lead in providence and ordering the world according to the counsel of His will. Now, one thing we've said over and over that uh, Pastor Allen said, even from Ephesians 1, is that the Father is the initiator of our salvation. And this makes sense. If the Father is the source of the Son and the Spirit, it makes sense that the Father would be the initiator of our salvation. So, for example, let's say that there is a publishing company, a publishing company who wants a book to be written. If our salvation is that book, our salvation is a book that, uh, that, that needs to be written, then the Father is the publishing company who wants it to be written. They go to an author and say, we want you to write this book. The author would be Jesus. In Hebrews 12, he's the author of our salvation. And the Holy Spirit would be like the distributor that gets that book into people's hands. But none of it happens without the initiation of the publishing company. Do you see that? Without the initiation of the Father, nothing happens. Our salvation does not happen without the initiation of the Father. Thirdly, the Father is the source of all good things. All good things come from the Father. Ephesians 1, we read that the Father gives the Spirit. 
We also read that the Father raised the Son from the dead and gave Him the fullness of His glory. Paul tells us in Ephesians 1.22, it says, He put all things, the Father put all things under the Son's feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church. The Father is the source of all good things. Ephesians 2, chapter 2, we read that the Father, by His grace, made us alive together with Christ. That's Ephesians 2, verse 5. Other places in Scripture, we see this, James 1, verse 17. I love this, I love this. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. We see the same sentiment in Ephesians 4, verse 6. We read that there is one God, one Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And then finally, Ephesians 5, verse 20, Paul tells us to give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we give thanks to God the Father for everything? Because He is the author. He is the source of all good things. Let me ask you, what's good in your life right now? What's good? Now, I, that, there, that, could be, that could be things we enjoy. That could be things, um, yeah, that, that, are, that, we, that the world even counts as good. But there can also be other things in our life that the world would not traditionally count as good, but we know are for our good. What is good in your life right now? Well, the, I want to tell you that the Father is the source of that good thing. And have you thanked Him for it? When Paul says, give thanks in everything for everything, give thanks to the Father, it's because He is the source of all good things. Let's go to the Son. Jesus. Through the Son, through Jesus, we have union with the Father. Now, first of all, Jesus has union with the Father. Because you can't be a resource for something that you don't have yourself, right? If I come up to you and say, uh, now, hey, uh, do you want me to teach you how to crochet a sweater? Hey, Stephen, you want to learn how to crochet a sweater? Sure you do. Sorry, I don't know how to crochet a sweater. Bummer. <laughs> you know, like that would, that would be a ridiculous statement to make, right? I don't have that resource. Like you would rightfully consider me crazy because I'm offering something that I don't have myself. Jesus has union with the Father. Through Jesus, we have union with the Father. In John 10, verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. That's, that's the most concise way to put it. Jesus has union with the Father. I and the Father are one. And so in Ephesians 1, verse 7 When Paul says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And in Ephesians 2, verse 18, for through him, the Son, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Well, there's all three persons of the Trinity right there. Through Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. It is only because of and through Christ that we have union with the Father, that we even have that that access, that we have that possibility is only because of Jesus. And, it's, and when we say union, that's not simply a, 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 like a loose, like a group of people with maybe loose connections. You know, it's, we, we could call that a union uh, today. No, 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 Paul goes further. He, when, when he says, when he talks about this union that we have with the Father, he actually goes even deeper with his analogy. He says, we are adopted into the Father's family through Jesus. This is, this, is no, this is no weak union. This is adopted into God's family through Jesus. Ephesians 1, verse 5, in love, he predestined us, the Father predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. A few verses later, Ephesians 1, verse 11, in him, in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Again, in Christ. God works his providence. God works his will through Christ. It's because of and through Christ that we have union and acceptance with the Father. Now, the cry of every human being, I, I, I truly believe this is that, whether we consciously realize this or not, this is the cry of every human being today and throughout history. It's acceptance. Every human being craves acceptance. I think some of us don't realize it as much as is actually true. Now today, and always, there's always been false messages about how you achieve that acceptance, right? And today is no exception. We, we, we've talked about this a little bit recently. Uh, live for yourself. Speak your truth. Uh, look for affirmation. You know, if friends don't affirm you, then get rid of them. Find friends that do affirm you. These, these are the messages that we hear today about how to gain 
acceptance. That's just a short list of, of these deficient message, messages. But what does Paul tell us? Well, the Lord through Paul tells us in Ephesians 2 that we are naturally, we are spiritually dead because of our sin. We are dead. There, there is, there, we, we, we start off from a place of death. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, and by grace you have been saved. That is the good news of the gospel, and that is only because of Jesus that we have this. Through Jesus, we have full acceptance by the Father. Through Jesus, we are adopted into the family of the Father. Through Jesus, we have union with the Father. Through the Son, we also have union with other believers. So we have union with the Father, but we also have union with each other, with other believers. Paul writes, he writes to this Gentile Ephesian church, in Ephesians 2, 2, he says, remember, hey, remember that you were at that time, you were at one time separated from Christ, you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. A dismal summary, if ever there was one. They say, remember, that was you, that was your state. And I want to tell you, Christian brothers and sisters in this room, joining us online, watching this later, that was you. That was you. That was me. We were all had, had this, this state of separation apart from God. There was a time where you were not only separated from God, you were separated from the family of God. Everyone had a time in their life when that was true. And now remember, in this time that Paul is writing this letter, there's a lot of natural division between Jew and Gentile, between God's historic people and people who have not historically been included among God's people, but who are now being included. In this. And so Jews are trying to figure out what's going on. Okay, do, are we supposed to be uh, unified with them? And Paul is saying unequivocally, yes, Jews and Gentiles should be together. But it was not natural. That is not a natural thing to bring Jew and Gentile in this time together. Not natural to bring them together in Christian community. But Paul says this, because of Jesus, it works. Because of Jesus, it works. And not only does it work, it's inevitable. It is inevitable that people of different backgrounds, different experiences, different ethnicities are going to come together, whether it's now or later, it is going to happen. And Lord willing, may it be now. Ephesians 2, verses 13 and 16 through 16. It says that Jesus is our peace. He has broken down this dividing wall of hostility that stood between us and others that are different from us. Jesus has broken down this wall. There's a natural wall that is between us and people with different, who are just different, different experiences that look different. Black and white and every color in between. They're going to have preferences. We're going to have our own preferences of how we, how we like things, how we live our lives, how we gather together, how we interact. But brothers and sisters, the church should be different. Because of Jesus, we have an example of how to lay down our preferences. We have an example in Jesus of how to lay down our desires and lie, our very lives, and lay them down for each other. So like we talked about last week, you have more in common, I have more in common with a fellow believer of any ethnicity, nationality, age, or gender than I do with a non-believer of the same ethnicity, nationality, gender. You see that? I, I, have, I have much more in common with a believer anywhere in the world than I do with my next-door neighbor who looks exactly like me. This is a commonality found in Christ. And it's because of the, that the Son gives us union with other believers. Thirdly, for the Son, we have victory over evil. This is something we've talked about at the very end of Ephesians. It should be fresh in our minds. God has given Jesus victory over all spiritual enemies. In Ephesians 1, 20 through 21, he get, Paul gives this, uh, this kind of foreshadowing for how he's going to end up in Ephesians 6. So at the very beginning... Ephesians 1, 20-21, He raised Christ from the dead, seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. There's not much more to say about that. We, we just finished talking about how our struggle is not against flesh and blood, it's against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, but we've also just finished talking about how in Christ, God has given us everything we need to face our spiritual enemy. Through, through the Son, we have victory over evil. Let's move to the Holy Spirit. We talked about the Father, we talked about the Son. The Holy Spirit 
First of, all, first of all, we see in Ephesians, the Holy Spirit is our guarantee of eternal life. Remember how in Christ we've, we've gained this inheritance from the Father? Paul talks about this in, in chapter 1. We've gained this inheritance. We, we have something that, that, that to look forward to that will be coming in the future. Well, the Father, didn't ju- He didn't just promise it to us and then just leave us alone. And say, yep, it's going to come. Just uh, good luck with that. Nope, He didn't do that. He expects us to trust Him, sure. But He's also promised to be with us. And this is where the Holy Spirit of God comes in. But Paul says this in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. It's right after he said that in Christ we have gained this inheritance. He says, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. God gives us His Holy Spirit as a seal, as a guarantee. We're in the process of of, of buying a house, and so at some point in this process, we gave a a large sum of money that that signaled that we were serious about this house, right? That's just part of the process of buying a house. It wasn't the full portion, but what it did is it communicated to the seller that we're in, we're here, we're locked in, we're not going anywhere. That's what God has done with his spirit. Yet, so so there, is a, there is a future inheritance that is coming our way, but God in the meantime has given us of himself. He has given us his spirit. And, and, and followers of Jesus have something coming. There is, there is inheritance coming for the follower of Jesus. And just like we're going to, we're going to close on our house this Friday, Lord willing, one day we will close on this life. All right, this life will be done, and that will be much more of an upgrade than new floors and more square footage. I promise you that. It's going to be so much better than that. But until then, God has given us his Holy Spirit to be with us, to be in us, to guide us, to guide us in these times, and to, ha- and to guide us into all truth, the truth of following Jesus, and to be more made into his image. He's not left us alone. You are not alone. You are not alone. You have the Spirit of God in you. And he is our guarantee of eternal life. So he's our guarantee of eternal life. He exists, he, he lives in us. And as he does that, what does he do? He points to Jesus. The Holy Spirit points to Jesus. Paul says in Ephesians 3, verse 4 and through 5, the mystery of Christ was not made known to the sons of men and other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So Paul is saying, hey, there were people in previous generations, they didn't know this stuff. It was a mystery to them. And yes, they, they could put their faith in God and trust that he was going to come through and bring salvation to his people, but they didn't know this. But Paul says, hey, the Holy Spirit at this point, he has revealed this mystery, and the mystery is Jesus. The Holy Spirit is constantly pointing to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is constantly uh, working to mold us more into the image of Jesus. Uh, Romans chapter 8 says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. As we live, as we try to live this life the best that we can, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. And remember, the Holy Spirit is 100% God, just as the Father and the Son are 100% God. Because in giving us the Holy Spirit, God has given us of Himself. You see that? And I I think some of the the pitfall for us is in our language. Uh, God, the Father, the Son, and Jesus, those are all more personal languages. Sometimes we use um, the Holy Spirit, and it sounds more impersonal. But I want to assure you that the Holy Spirit is just as personal as anyone. And in fact, it is the Holy Spirit of God that lives within us. He doesn't, God, the the Father doesn't just give us this impersonal force. An impersonal force can't point to anything. An impersonal force has no desires. An impersonal force can't be grieved. But all these things are true about the Holy Spirit. When God gives us the Holy Spirit, He gives us of Himself and it points to Jesus. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit helps us to be unified in Christ. Ephesians 2, verse 22. In Him, in Christ, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We're being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Ephesians 4, verse 3, just a couple of chapters later. Paul urges them to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
The Holy Spirit helps us to be unified in Christ. That is one of the main purposes of the Holy Spirit of God. God has given us Himself. And when we listen to the Spirit, when we obey the Spirit, when we rest in the Spirit, we find that we have unity with all other believers. Would you look at that? When, when we are in tune, when we follow the Spirit of God within us, we find, ah, I have unity with other believers, even believers that are different from me because we are truly resting in what Christ has done for us. The more that we rest in what Christ has done for us, the more we can have unity with one another. So there's one God who eternally has existed in three persons, and each of those persons is fully God. Paul has gone to great lengths in Ephesians. He goes to great lengths to describe the function of each person and how the Father, how the Son, how the Holy Spirit help us. And I think that what we don't often emphasize as Christians, even when we're looking at the doctrine of the Trinity, sometimes this, this, this misses us. I think this is so important. In the Trinity, we find the basis for Christian fellowship. Right? So we, we, we've gone through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and some of the truths that we see in Ephesians about each of them. In the Trinity, in, 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 in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, each working and working in us and pointing to Jesus, we find the basis for Christian fellowship. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they engage with one another in perfect unity. And in doing so, they give us a perfect picture of what Christian fellowship can and should look like. And he, here's why they do that. Each person of the Trinity is always pointing to another person of the Trinity. Do you see that? The Father sends the Son and the Spirit at the transfiguration of Jesus. When, and during Jesus' life, when he was on earth, he took Peter, James, and John, went up to a mountain, and he became transfigured. He became a, kind of a, a hint at his eternal resurrected body. He, he shone bright white, and the disciples were just amazed at what was going on. This is the transfiguration of Jesus. And when that happened, a voice, the Father, said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. You see that? The Father was pointing to Jesus. Listen to this guy. Listen to him. The Son, Jesus, says in John 5, verse 19, The Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. So the Son pointing to the Father. The Son also says, just a few chapters later in John 16, verse 7, He says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You see that? Jesus points to the Father and to the Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is building up the body of Christ for the glory of the Father. We read that in Ephesians 2, 22. Now the Spirit testifies about the Son. In Ephesians 3, verse 4 and 5, which we read earlier, Paul writes that the mystery of Christ has now been revealed to apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So the Spirit is always pointing to Christ. That's what we talked about. So in the, in the triune God, and in, in this God who exists as a trinity, we see this perfect example of Christian fellowship. We talked about this a little bit last week, right? Remember the, the discipleship wheel. We had prayer, we had the word, we had fellowship, we had witnessing. Fellowship. This is a perfect example. This is a huge reason why it is so important to understand the trinity more fully, because in doing so, we understand how to live as Christians more. So we find the basis for Christian fellowship in the Trinity. But we also understand the Trinity better so that we can understand the gospel better. This is big. And there's a, a book called Theology for the Church, and uh, each chapter has a different author to it, but the, uh, the chapter on God was written by a guy named Timothy George. He's a, uh, he lives today. He's an American theologian. He wrote this about God and the doctrine of the Trinity. He said, The doctrine of the Trinity is the necessary theological framework for understanding the biblical account of Jesus as the true story of God. And if what the Bible says about Jesus is anything other than that, then we have no gospel. You see that? If we lose the Trinity, <laughs> we have no gospel. We've got nothing. You know, I, I, I've heard when people say that the Father sending the Son to earth to die in our place, when they call that cosmic child abuse. That's a, it's a phrase that's used often today. When that phrase is used, that it, it really shows there's not a true understanding of the nature of God. 
And so it is important for us to understand who is God, how does this work? Because if the doctrine of the Trinity is true, then we know that the gospel is true. We know that the Father loves all people. We know that He loves you. He loves me. He loved me enough that when, when, when all of us, when we reached a point where we could not save ourselves, God, the Father, decided to come Himself. So God decided, I'm going to come Myself. And so He gave of Himself in sending the Son to earth. He came to earth to live in our place and to live the, the, the life of perfection that is, God's, that is the Father's standard that none of us ever could have lived. No human being could ever live this perfect life. Jesus came, lived among us. He lived in our shoes. And he not only lived in our shoes, but he took on the wrath of God that was meant for us, that we deserve. And he died in our place, but not only did he die, but he rose from the dead. God raised Jesus from the dead through his spirit. And when he did that, Jesus ascended and now sits at the right hand of the throne of the Father. And as, as we've read so often in Ephesians, he now stands in glory, in victory over all spiritual evil, over death. When he did that, he didn't leave us alone, remember? He left us his Holy Spirit, who will be with us until we see Jesus face to face. This is the truth of the gospel. And when we put our faith in what Jesus has done, when we rest in him, that is when we find true eternal life. And so when we, when we think of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it rests, and, and the truth of the gospel, it rests upon the work, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. So I want to end today by reading something that was written 1,700 years ago. I mentioned the Council of Nicaea earlier. 325 AD, uh, Christian leaders from all over the world, they gathered to talk about the, a particular wrong view of the Trinity, and we're not going to get into that heresy anymore, but I want to read the statement that came out of it. Because they, they came up with a statement that clearly states the doctrine of the Trinity. It clearly states the nature of God as being one being in three persons. And this has been the creed of Christians ever since. And we continue today. And I think it's just an amazing thing that Southfield Christian Fellowship has gathered today, as are many, many churches across Arlington, across Texas, across the United States, and across the world who are unified in what we're about to read 1,700 years later. So this is called the Nicene Creed. It says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. And in one, Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You'll notice as the middle section is longer <laughs> about the work of Jesus. Remember, it is Jesus, God, when God gave of the Son, that is God giving of himself to give us Jesus, to, to step in our place, to be our Savior and our Lord and our King. May we submit to Jesus and submit to Christ more and more each day, and not through our own strength, but through the strength of the Holy Spirit of God, all to the glory of the Father. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. We praise you for your good work. We praise you for how you have revealed yourself. You have revealed yourself through your word, God, but through so many um, of your people. And so we thank you for Jesus, God. We thank you that you have given us uh, salvation. You have sent your son. You have remedied our predicaments, God. You have given us uh, a way out and th through faith in Jesus. So I thank you for that. 
We thank you for your spirit, God, that helps us, that gives us the um, words to say when we have no words, who is interceding for us even now, before your throne. So God, may we know you more each day. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.